Hi, I'm Russ Lowenthal with Oracle Database Security Product Management. I'm going to talk to you today about Kerberos authentication, which is really your easiest way to integrate your Oracle database with Microsoft Active Directory. And for most people who are moving on to centrally managed users, Kerberos authentication is really a crucial first step. If you're interested more in centrally managed users, I'll be talking about that in a follow-on video to this one. Before we get too far into this, uh, there's a few terms and definitions you want to understand I'll be using throughout today's topic. Uh, I'm not going to read them to you, but one in particular I want to call your attention to is Kerberos principle. When I'm talking about a Kerberos principle, I'm talking about usually the person logging in. You can use it to refer to a database or a printer or just about anything in the Kerberos world. But normally when I talk about a Kerberos principle, it's the, the person who's logging into the database. Kerberos has been around for a very long time here at Oracle. We first started with it uh, back in Oracle 7.3, which takes you all the way back to the early 90s. Uh, we've been continuously improving Kerberos ever since. Uh, back when we first introduced Kerberos, it was common to have a separate Kerberos server, a standalone service. As time has gone on, almost everybody who does Kerberos nowadays simply uses the built-in Kerberos server in Microsoft Active Directory. Uh, and Kerberos is, like I said, our second most common method of authenticating to the database, uh, right after username and password. Uh, it is the least intrusive mechanism for Active Directory integration because it requires really no changes to Active Directory. There's no schema changes within the Active Directory uh, setup. There's no plugins to install. Uh, this is normal Active Directory functionality. Let me take you through a quick demonstration of Kerberos. Let's take a look at Kerberos in action. I'm going to log in. Uh, first, I've got a Windows client here. So what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, take a quick look at the Kerberos tickets that I already have uh, and I've got a ticket here that uh, identifies me as rloent, that's my my Active Directory login, and my domain is dbseclabs.com. If I want to connect to a database it's just slash at the database alias and you can see I'm now logged into the database and I'm logged in as the user rloent. On Linux, I have to do a little bit more. Uh, I don't have any tickets by default, so I have to initialize my session. So I will give it OK, I N I T, and the username that I want to log in as. I now give it my password in Active Directory. And if I do an OK list, I can see, sure enough, I have a Kerberos ticket. From this point on, it works just the same way as it does on Windows. Let's see, plus, at pdb1. I'm logged in, and if I show which user I'm logged in as, it's rloan. Kerberos is just that easy. All right, as you noticed, I did two Kerberos logins. The first thing I did was I went to a Windows client and I just did a simple login on Windows. And if you're paying attention, you notice that I didn't have to authenticate or re-authenticate to my database. That's because my client was set up to use the Kerberos ticket I got when I logged in to my Windows desktop. I didn't have to do anything else other than that, Kerber other than that login. The second login I did was my Linux login, where before I could log into the database, I first had to go out and initialize my Kerberos session. I had to authenticate to prove who I was, and that's what I did with that OK init command. So two ways to do this. It works on Windows. It works on Linux. Now on Windows, I chose to use my in-memory ticket, my default. I don't have to. I could set it up the same way that I did on Linux, but then I lose some of the benefits of being on a Windows platform. Normally what I want is single sign-on. All right. Let's talk a little bit about implementation of Kerberos. Uh, when you're going to set Kerberos up, you're going to be doing some work in three different areas. There's some things you'll have to do on the database server. There's some things you'll have to do on the Active Directory domain controller. And there's some things that you're going to have to do on the database client. Let's start with the one that concerns most people on the domain controller. You're not doing anything unusual. The things you'll be asked to do for domain controller are very normal to an uh, Active Directory administrator. On the database server, there's a few configuration files you're going to have to set up, and same thing on the database client. 
One of the most important of those files that you'll be setting up on both the database server and the client is a file called your krb5.conf. This is the master configuration file for Kerberos. We have three key sections that we use in the krb5.conf. The first is lib defaults. This is where we put our parameters that deal with how Kerberos is going to behave. Things like clock skew, which tells us how far apart can our database client or database client be from the database server from the Active Directory. Important to have it set far enough apart that a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes difference don't cause a problem. Is my Kerberos ticket affordable? If I get a Kerberos ticket on my database client, I authenticate to my database server. My database server then needs to send that Kerberos ticket somewhere else. Do we allow it to or not? If you're using database links, you always want your tickets to be affordable, by the way. The next section is realms. This is really simple. If I get a Kerberos ticket into the database, I have to know where to go to look to see whether it's a valid ticket or not. So this tells me what is the address for the domain controllers I want to talk to. You may notice that in mine, I'm just using the domain name and I'm allowing DNS to resolve down to what IP addresses to go to. The final section is the domain realm. And here you'll notice it looks a little bit repetitive. What I'm using the Domain Realm section for is lookups. I get in a Kerberos ticket that says rust.com. Well, where is the domain controller for that? I'm going to go find that from the Realm section, but which entry in the Realm section should I use? I can have multiple aliases for a single Realm entry, and that's what you see here. Another reason why it's a little bit repetitive is Kerberos is case sensitive. So you'll notice I have every single one of my entries, both in uppercase and lowercase, just to account for case sensitivity. Once I've got my krb5.com set up, I move to the sqlnet.org. Here again, this is on both the client and the server. Uh, I'll set up what the name of my Kerberos service is going to be. I always use Oracle, but that's an arbitrary name. You can really use anything. I tell it where my krb5.conf is going to be, uh, what my authentication methods are going to be. You're probably used to seeing BEQ on your servers. You wouldn't put BEQ on your client, but BEQ on your servers. And then Kerberos 5 Pre and Kerberos 5. Uh, are we going to allow fallback authentication? If we try to connect to the database, say slash uh, as sysdba, and Kerberos doesn't work because Slash is how we log in with Kerberos, do we want to fall back to BEQ? You almost always do. Again, we have our clock skew. Uh, Kerberos 5 conf underscore MIT, it's always going to be set to true. There's a special file that only appears on the database server called the key tab. We'll put that in there. And on the client, do we want to use the in-memory ticket? That's that OSMSFT. Or do we want to use a file-based ticket? Uh, you see I've got... The key tab entry is only on the database server. The CC name, that's only on the database client. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, we talked a little bit about SQLNet.ora already. Uh, here's just a little more information on each of those different entries that I put in, if you're interested. There's another file that's required. This is only issued to the database server. It's the database key tab, and this is generated on the domain controller. So the command you're going to see here, ktpass, this is a command that you run from the domain controller, not from a domain client, from a domain controller. And what you're basically doing is you're issuing a persistent token, a key tab, to the database server that allows it to authenticate back to Active Directory. Because remember, we're running on a Linux server. We're not part of the domain. We're mapping that persistent token which, which puts the database host name, in my case, rustdbseclabs.dbseclabs.com, it maps that to a user in Active Directory. In the case you see here, I'm mapping rustdbseclabs.dbseclabs.com to George. What types of crypto we're going to allow? I said to allow them all. Uh, and what we want our output file to be set up to. The next one you very seldom have to change anymore, but sometimes you'll still run into this, particularly if you're running your database on AIX. You may have to edit the default services file that comes with your operating system to add in Kerberos 5. Some uh, distributions will ship with just the word Kerberos in there. We require that you specify Kerberos 5. Okay. 
Uh, let's see, uh, the hostname command uh, on your database, uh, you have to have, your database server, I mean, your, your hostname has to resolve to an IP address. And this is almost always going to be set up for you by default, but you may have to edit your Etsy host file uh, to make sure the fully qualified name is first in your list of aliases. Uh, for your database, you're going to set up a user. Uh, in my case, I'll just use Russ, and you're going to say that user is identified externally as whatever the Kerberos principal name is. You may remember when I did my demonstration and I did my OK list, I saw that I was rlowenth at dbseclabs.com. So I'll create my database user Russ to do that. Okay. Uh, and for firewall considerations, both your database and your client have to be able to talk to Active Directory, and Active Directory has to be able to respond. That's probably pretty common sense. Um, I showed you on command line, Kerberos works with most of the major tools, so I've used Kerberos with Toad. Uh, it's pretty easy to set up with SQL Developer. You have two choices. You can use either the thick driver or the thin driver. I'll normally go with the thick driver, which means I have to have a full database client, especially if I'm on Windows, because then I can use the in-memory ticket. If I use the thin driver, the Kerberos thin configuration, I can only use file-based Kerberos cache. Uh, there's a couple of support notes you might want to know about. I'll leave them here on the screen for a second. But other than that, once you've got those files set up, uh, the way I've showed you in this video, you are ready to go with Kerberos. And if you want to take your Active Directory integration to the next step, please join me in my next blog and video entry when we're going to talk about centrally managed users. Thank you.